and welcome to Open Line. I'm Starlene Stringer. Well, many of you share your homes with dogs and cats, but you may not know that there are a lot of other critters here in our city and perhaps in your neighborhood. On this edition of Open Line, we are talking about urban wildlife. Viewers were invited to submit questions via email, Facebook, and Twitter, and we'll be getting those answered throughout the show. Our guests are Irving Animal Services Manager Fred Sanderson, wildlife expert Cliff Moore from Animal Services Incorporated, and snake expert Barry Allen. Now you may know Barry from Water Utilities, but he's also a herpetologist who brought some snakes with him today. Thank you all so much for being here. It's my pleasure. Now this is gonna be a fun, fun show, I'm sure. And we're gonna start with you, Fred, because we're gonna go through these one by one, but what are the major types of urban wildlife here in Irving? Well, we have normal raccoons, skunks, possums, you know, foxes, coyotes, uh, hmm. there's a, and that's just the mammals on the ground. So we're, we do have a lot of urban wildlife. There could be bats, could be migratory birds. A little and this, and I'll a little let Cliff that. expand on anything I missed. Yeah, but you sure. know what? One thing I'll, before you do that, I want to talk about the pigs because that's something you didn't mention. Oh, I and thought. I know, yeah, a lot of us remember the efforts to control wild pigs along the Trinity River. So how is that effort going? It's we. Uh, the first year we were real successful, you know, yeah. remember we caught like 239 of them and this year we just worked it in the winter months a little bit, but we were still able to capture 40 um, along, the, we're, uh, along the Trinity Trails. So they'll be here for a long time. Occasionally we'll have to go, they'll become a nuisance and we'll have to trap them. So Cliff, you helped a lot with that project. Tell me about what you helped to do. Yes ma'am, um, in order to understand what our role was, uh, we had to understand what the role of animal services was. Um, at the heart of it is protection of the public health, safety, and property. And that's priority one is public health, safety, and property. And secondly, a very close second is protection of the wildlife and the animals. Right. We evaluated and estimated the population. We set up a removal plan, a humane live capture removal plan, and we're infinitely successful in a short amount of time. When we're managing wildlife, we have to be aware that these animals continue to breed. So the quicker you can achieve control, the better your success. If you catch uh, 250 animals over a year, mm -hmm. it's not near as effective as if you catch 250 animals over a month. Wow. Yeah. Makes sense. Okay, it's your turn here, Barry. Show us what you brought. Just keep it over there on that side of the desk. I'll certainly <laughs> do that. Uh, I brought a couple of native snakes to Irving. You know, Irving uh, and the rest of the Metroplex has a lot of snakes that are indigenous to this North Texas area, huh. uh, right around 40 or so. Uh, most of them are non-venomous. However, we do have says most. venomous <laughs> snakes in North Texas. We've got copperheads. We've got, of course, the water moccasin. Right. Uh, and, and a couple of different rattlesnake snakes and then rarely coral snakes. Now this here is a eastern yellow-bellied racer. Um, mm -hmm. It's commonly seen during the daytime. It's a very fast agile snake. Um, it's harmless. It's not going to hurt you. Um, it's going to bite me. Except you. Yeah, there, there Let's we keep go. him over there. And, you know, that <laughs> probably didn't even break the skin. Right. But um, these snakes are harmless. They eat a lot of insects. They'll eat uh, small rodents uh, and then they'll eat um, let me get the camera here, and then they'll eat um, uh, other snakes, believe it or not. Yeah. Oh, wow. King snakes aren't yes. the only snakes that eat other snakes. Um, next, what I have is, um, yeah, go yeah, ahead. He's putting that one away. Me. That one's going a little um, wild over there. <laughs> he just gets a little aggravated. He matches the bags. Um, he's got though. a real bright light. He's not used to the face. bright lights, yeah. 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 And he's kind of a nervous snake, but as you can see, right. it didn't hurt me. He's no, pretty, no. though, and he no, matches no. your bag. Matches the bag, that's right, today. green on green. <laughs> it's a fashion it's a snake, um, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, next, the next snake that, that I have, and, and it is found uh, throughout, uh, especially southeastern Irving, uh, is a eastern hognose snake. Now, hognose. hognose snakes are really cool snakes. Now, the eastern hognose snakes aren't going to make a good pet because they eat toads, and almost exclusively Aww. toads. Um, the That's western nice. hognose snakes that we have, they do eat uh, mice, so they can make good pets. But the unique thing about the hognose snake, other than its upturned snout here, is that when um, it is perturbed, uh -huh. It will flatten its head out and act like a cobra. If that wow. doesn't work, um, then what it does is it plays dead, and it thinks it has to be on its back to be dead. So if you flip it back over on its 
on its belly, it will, it will flip back over. And maybe we can get him to, to, to spread him, out here. Yeah, a little make bit. him do yeah. it. <laughs> he's, he's, he, he's not used to the lights either. But That's okay. He's got a good shot there. They're getting remember, really there, there are a lot of snakes that are very beneficial here in the Metroplex, Irving huh. included. And uh, most people have the old saying that the only good snake's a dead snake. Well, if you that. find a rat snake in your garage, that tells me that you've got a much bigger problem. You've got a rodent problem, okay? Mm. So you want to have the snakes around. Now, if you can't get a hold of somebody like me, uh, then I don't have a problem with you killing a venomous snake as long as you do that correctly. Most of the time, animal control is going to be able to come out and take care of the situation. So there's no need to really do that. Um, best thing to do is leave the snake alone, take a picture of it, consider yourself lucky. Yeah. Huh. Well, let me ask you this before you do that. How do you tell if it's poisonous? You said you don't mind as long as it's, you know, but how do you know if it's poisonous or not? I mean, there's a skill level where you can recognize this. Some of us don't want that skill. But if you <laughs> feel unsafe, and that's part of animal control's role, uh -huh. you can call animal control about a snake in your house day or night. And I do. You know, and whenever so you, you guys, y'all are good. <laughs> so, <laughs> Every time I see anything, you know, call animal go control. Go to a professional. You know, we'll relocate it if we can. And, mm -hmm. and, um, make sure the snakes gets out of harm's way. We appreciate yeah. that. If, if I could weigh sure. in on that. Sure. One of the things that I found very successful and, and it's, it's a decent thing to remember is if you can get close enough to the snake to see his eyeball. Mm. And most people can get within six, eight feet of a snake and take a look at his eye. Mm -hmm. If the pupil is round like a human, yeah. it's okay. If it's oh. a slit like a cat, it's a pit viper and it's venomous. Now, that is something only for our area because the herps, I'm sorry, the herpetologists <laughs> know <laughs> that there's the liar snake that, that has a cat eye. There's a coral snake that has a round eye. We have very few of either one, I mean rare. Yeah. The, the venomous snakes that we're worried about up here are the rattlesnake, the copperhead, and the water moccasin. And we have a couple of species of, we're kind of at an overlap of the northern timber rattler and the western diamondback rattler. And all of those four snakes have got an eye like a cat. Yeah, and they're rare. And they're, they're rare. They are rare. Everybody uh, jumps to that, so they're rare. Yeah. They are That's rare. Good to know. Here's, here's, here's an old saying, you know, they always say if it has a heat sensing pit in between its eye and its nostril, yeah. if it's got elliptical pupils, if its head is triangular, you know, it's it's going to be venomous. But I always tell people, if you can see that, you're too close. Okay? Amen to that. Now, I was thinking, you know, I'm not even going to get that close to know. Here's a much easier way to look at it. If it has spots, okay, okay, if it has blotches, if it has diamonds, okay, and, or stripes, okay, and it doesn't have a rattle on the end of its tail, uh -huh. non-venomous. Okay, the, the, the rattlesnakes are the ones that have the diamonds and the spots. You're never going to see one that's got stripes on its back, but um, they, have, they have diamonds or spots. The, the two species other than that are the copperheads, which have bands, mm -hmm. and the cottonmouth or water moccasin. It, al it also has bands, yeah, okay? So, oh my. Yeah, so I, you know, I reckon, man, not everybody's going to get that detailed. Barry's right. been doing it for 20 plus years. Cliff uh, has been doing it yes. for 20 plus years. If you're uncomfortable with a snake, yeah. on your property or That'd in your house, <laughs> please, call <laughs> please contact Animal call Services. And I, and I appreciate and you guys we'll being there. And I know there are a lot of other people that feel the same way too sure. that are saying, thank God y'all are there to help us out. So we appreciate right. that. But that information you gave was good though, That's because good. yeah, I never heard about the whole eye thing. So it, yeah. I wanted to give um, people the opportunity mm -hmm. if they feel comfortable to get close enough because knowledge is what removes the fear. Right. The more you know about a particular animal, sure. the less your level of fear is, and at least justifiable fear. Right. And, and they're, they're very beneficial, and Barry alluded to it early. If you call me and you have a snake in your garage, uh -huh. I can already see that you've got brush piles outside, oh, or absolutely. you, you yeah, haven't been in your garage, and if you're honest, you'll tell me you have mice. Uh. You have a mice <laughs> or worse, rats. <laughs> or yeah. worse, rats. Oh right. now, here's oh what I suggest to people is they go to any bookstore, yes. Um, you know, they'll have some great field guides on okay. reptiles and amphibians. Some have great color plates, some have great pictures, uh -huh. and it'll also have a range map of where that snake is found. And, okay, and very it's interesting. Just good to know also. Well, snakes are definitely interesting, but I know, Fred, yeah. earlier we went through some of the other animals that are here in Irving as well, and something like foxes, um, where, where are they most commonly found? Well, they're all over Irving. Really? And, and uh, 
they are trying to survive among us with all the development going on. And it's not just foxes, it's bobcats are trying to survive among us. Wow. Um, uh, I always think it's a blessing when you see urban wildlife, you know, huh. in your space. But uh, you remember we want to be, uh, be safe. You can always be sure. safe with animals in your backyard. If you're uncomfortable with it, please call us. Okay, you know. and there's some benefits, right Cliff? What are the benefits of things like foxes? The the indigenous wildlife, especially the predators, um, have a role to play in a fully functional ecosystem. Your backyard is not a fully functional ecosystem. When we look at foxes, bobcats, coyotes, wolves, bears, mountain lions, mm -hmm. all are classified as higher order predators. They're pretty much the top of the food chain. As the largest predator gets removed, the next level predator does really well. So if we remove, remove all of the coyotes, then the bobcats do well. Remove all of the coyotes and bobcats, the foxes do well. Mm -hmm. They are designated dangerous wild animals in the Health and Safety Code, Chapter 822. If we can't have them as pets, we really don't want them owning our backyards, living under our decks. So right. if you feel uncomfortable that you and, and you feel this concern, there's a reason why. That's almost innate to humans mm -hmm. to fear something that might hurt their children or might hurt their companion sure. animals. The sure. companion animals, and, and I always hate the discussion about what is an acceptable risk. Um, if you have a cat or a dog, they're more at risk than an adult human. A fox is relatively small, yay big, not counting his tail. Right. But what is an acceptable risk and where does it fall? These are all value judgments that the individual homeowner can make. And again, we strongly suggest call professionals. Well, I was going to really ask. Let's really evaluate That's good what's to know because exactly when do you say, okay, I should call? Because sometimes you think, well, I'm there calling for nothing. That, that's you know, a Fred this is the batteries in the call. So, Fred, when should you they know, call? When in doubt, call. Okay. Uh, when in doubt. Usually, when we get the call, people have had the problem, perceived problem, for a long time. Mm -hmm. You know, and they're just now getting around to contacting us. And we can help them early. You know, okay. we can help them early with how we handle any kind of an animal that's a nuisance in their backyard. We and want people to be safe in the environments that's theirs. And what's the best way they can reach you? Because I know a lot of times you panic, like me, when I saw a snake, <laughs> I dialed 911, the wrong number to call. <laughs> so, but they were very nice about it. Not necessarily yes, so is it the wrong true. number to call. And so it's, you know, when you're talking about a snake and it's, you see it in the park or you see it on an acre, it's not really an emergency, that's its natural habitat. Right. When you see a snake inside your house, that's when you I know, call. or in your garage, <laughs> Or you, a raccoons in your attic, uh -huh. you know. So there's two. There's different kinds of emergencies. If you see a raccoon in your backyard, maybe feeding where you're feeding that cat or dog, you know, contact us. You know, the next day, and we'll help set up a plan to help you resolve your problems. Wonderful. And if it's in your house, if you call, we'll respond that same day. Again, we thank y'all for being there. Okay. And you know, Barry, what? Let's go back to talking about those snakes. What do you do if you see a snake in your yard? How should you respond? Well, first of all, you'll have to understand what kind of species it is. If it's a small, nondescript gray snake, it's probably a rough earth snake. Um, if it has a slight pattern on it, may, maybe the DK snake, all of those snakes are actually beneficial to your garden. But Barry, um, I know you're saying that, but for yeah. someone like me, and people that are just not snake lovers, I see a snake, it's either you're gonna pass out, you're gonna scream, you're gonna run, you're gonna- Consider <laughs> yourself it. lucky and take a picture of it. And okay. you know, if, if it's in your yard and you're you gardening, <laughs> you know, have your husband remove it temporarily. Chances okay. are, there's more than one that's there and I've always told people look I could probably spend 25 minutes and, and collect you know several of these you may not want to hear that but that's how common they are wow. you just happen to see it um, the eastern yellow-bellied racer that's a common snake that we see um, in in the late spring and early summer Fred gets a lot of calls on the Texas rat snakes because they're gorging Everybody themselves on on the fledgling birds and they're really active and oh, wow. and as I tell people I say if you've got one prowling around your garage at night that tells me that you've got a much more serious problem. You've got a rodent problem, and you may mm. need to address that, take care of that, and you may not see as many rat snakes. Um, but if you're seeing all the small snakes, uh, people call them grass snakes and stuff mm -hmm. like that, those are completely harmless, and I've often told people, ma'am, turn out the light, he will be gone in the morning. And, and I know that's hard for somebody like you to understand it because you've right. got that fear of snakes. So you say, you where'd he go? Yeah. yeah, and just keep in mind, that they're beneficial. They're there for the garden, you know, that kind of thing. Now, if you start seeing shed skins like this, in your in your garden and stuff like that Concerned. that lets us know that you probably have a king snake or a rat snake you may see him you may not you huh. know it just depends but that lets us know that 
you have an, you have another problem. You have a rodent problem. And you said there are some benefits to having snakes. Uh, very, uh, very much so. And one of those is rodent control, of course. You know, and and uh, the smaller ones, of course, control other pests that are detrimental to your garden too. So hmm. very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Most people perceive snakes they see as venomous snakes. You know, very, and they'll know that if you get a six-foot copperhead, it's not a copperhead. You, uh. you know, they know it's normally a rat snake, and but people do panic, and right. so when they see snakes, so snakes can't hear. You can scream all you want to. <laughs> it's not going to help. Uh. <laughs> we'll get there as soon as we can, and often uh, in the panic, the snake gets destroyed by the homeowner because the fear is so great. So call us just step back it will try to do flight it'll try to get away if you give it the opportunity mm -hmm. so definitely now we, we're going to talk about some other animals and different things too fred and we have some pictures we have sure. an owl in particular are those pretty common yes they're pretty they're pretty common really? we, you know we even have an owl that we re removed before we blew up the stadium using that for an example oh, we got a permit cute. to make sure we removed it before because it's federally protected huh and, and people will call in, you know, when they gather or they have build a nest and they leave waste and people drive ways. They are federally protected. I recommend people leave them alone. And, Good uh, advice. They're cute. And what about this next picture, a beaver cotton irving? Well, they're common. <laughs> really? For a while we had a beaver, even behind our new shelter, we had a little beaver dam. Aww. They can be a nuisance, you know. They're introduced and Cliff can talk more about beavers, it's uh, endless. We do a lot of beaver work. Um, huh. The beavers were brought back in, reintroduced, relocated in, in the 50s because Texas Parks and Wildlife, our state regulatory agency over fish and game, it's yeah. the easiest way to look at them, recognized the ecological niche that they filled. Um, they are uh, a ecosystem generator. Okay. It doesn't work in a manicured backyard pond. Beavers <laughs> manage for beavers. They'll, they'll do a lot of damage. They uh, will take the tree really trees down. out and your landscaping. Beavers are nature's engineers. <laughs> wow. So. so what we have in an urban environment is we have humans with a pond. They mm -hmm. want to plant their crepe myrtles in their bushes and, and have it manicured sure. down to the water's edge. And well, that doesn't fit with what Mr. Beaver wants to do. That's and he building uses material. All, <laughs> he uses all of our waterways to get up into your backyard pond and no it won't work it just won't um, again beavers manage for beavers and humans. So we've got beavers around yeah. here huh? so we have <laughs> beavers and nutria place. we have yeah. a lot we're blessed with a lot and of water coyotes and coyotes yes. too we have coyotes we have a picture of a coyote also um, that's interesting uh, tell me a little bit about the coyotes well they've managed to survive in our green space we rarely <laughs> catch them you know they really try to stay out of our way and these are particular animals if you perceive them to be a nuisance. If you have a home that backs up to a green space yes. and you're letting your little dog out and you see, you know, you have Yikes. to exercise some caution and recognize you're living with urban wildlife that could be dangerous. They look a lot like dogs. They look a, kind of like, I don't know, maybe a German Shepherd or something like that when you see them out sometimes. They come in different sizes. Usually if we're able to catch or capture them, then it usually it's because it's ill. Oh, really? You know, so they are quite difficult to They're capture really fast for us. Yeah. They're fast. Cliff is kind of an expert at, at tracking those nuisance animals. <laughs> we capture coyotes routinely. Um, we follow a concept of we look at the behavior of the particular group of animals that sure. the complaint comes in. Uh, we've done several where we found it was one bad acting leader coyote causing the other stack bad uh -huh. and we break the pack dynamic by capturing only that one and the rest disperse. We still have to focus on the amount of land we have to support these higher order predators. Again, the, f the views of the various citizens that we have are some of fear and some of admiration and some of want them to expand. These animals are going to breed every single year without fail. They don't get their shots. Yeah. They don't get spayed and neutered. And with the economic growth that we have, we're losing habitat. Hmm. So as long as we need economic growth, we can't have a steady state Makes sense. to say we have a thousand acre park, thousand acre nature center. It can support a family group of coyotes. Even at that, we will continue to overpopulate. Their huh. habitat's reducing and we have them north. We have them all over. Yes. You can go up north wow. and down south. And, and there's some other animals too, Cliff, like bobcats, raccoons, yes. possums. Tell yes. me how you handle those and how often you see them. Um, we see them routinely. Really? <laughs> we, we work seven days a week now. Wow. The, the common denominator to every one of these human wildlife conflicts 
is the animals have populated to the point the land can no longer support them. The raccoons, there's not an, they're cavity dinners. There's not enough cavities in our wild spaces. So they've moved up to the houses, they're under the decks, in the attics. Wow. We, we have a population problem. We use a philosophy called achieving the balance, where we want to balance what the land can support with what our citizens can tolerate. I see. And so we are complaint driven. Well, speaking about, of that, um, are there any of those animals that you've mentioned just in the past part of our conversation that are a threat to household pets that we may have in our backyard, say? Well, so a lot of them are considered high risk by the uh, Texas Department of Health. So mm. when you're talking about raccoons, skunks, you know, foxes and coyotes, they're, right. cons they're considered high rabies carriers. So it, it can be a public health issue for us. Okay. And we trap them virtually every day. Huh. There's a nuisance trap somewhere in Irving to target those specific animals. Interesting, okay. And Fred, are there things in our yard that we need to be aware of that might attract these animals? I mean, other than the rats and well, <laughs> anything can, somebody may can, have like that. You can create a natural draw. For example, if you're feeding your pet 24 hours a day, free feeding, well, that urban wildlife is going to recognize that. Ah. That when the, when the lights go out and the place it's gets quiet, for them quiet, too. Then, huh? You're going to bring <laughs> you're going to bring them in. That you're, makes sense. You're, you're feeding a cat, but you're going to be feeding raccoons, skunks, and possum if you put a game camera on that and watch what took place uh, there. I, I the tell night. people because they often call us about other types of animals, and I see telltale signs of a possum. You know. Sure. And, you know, I see the food dish for the pet that's outside and the water dish for the pet that's outside. And I said, after sundown, I said, why don't you just kind of come out here? I said, as Fred said, you could get a camera. And I said, you'll see Mr. Possum, I'll guarantee it. And they'll call me back and they'll say, I saw two or three of them. Yeah. And they wow. just never don't knew. Don't free feed yeah. is what we recommend. You know, oh, yeah. free feed your pet appropriately sure. and then pick it up. Makes sense. So you don't create that nuisance. Well, you know what? The questions that we have from Facebook are interesting, too. And one is from Sharon Creviston, and she wrote, um, I would like to attend a class on how to care for feral and abandoned house cats. Is that possible? Yes. Huh. We do as a concept in the, at Irving Animal Sup Services support TNR, which means trap, neuter, and return. Ah. And we you know, for those communities that are interested in doing it. If she would contact me personally, I'll be glad to share. Okay. Yeah it with her how to do that there is there is a correct way to do it or a wrong way to do it wonderful so there's her answer and um, she, she brings up an important topic there are a lot of misconceptions about feral cats and what should we clear up about that well um, feral cats have been around for decades and in an industry like animal welfare we, we just probably in the past 10 years in animal control started trying to control them because they don't have any natural predators so to speak of occasionally a coyote you know, and we have feral cats and we have stray cats. And for an example, animals that come to the shelter that are cats, only 2% of the homeowners think of coming there looking for their pets because oh, wow. they're accustomed to that. So spay and neuter, if you want to maintain a, a feral cats in your neighborhood that you participate actively, you know, with a spay and neuter program to reduce that population, because they can, they can get pregnant while they're nursing. Cats are very prolific. Wow. Very prolific. Wow. wow. And, and there's some other things that have misconceptions too. Like Barry, tell us about some of the misconceptions that come along with snakes. Well, the most obvious is uh, aren't all snakes poisonous or wow. venomous? You know, I always tell people snakes are venomous, plants are poisonous, but that's a, a common question, you know. And I try to tell people most of the time the snakes that you encounter are, are, are going to be uh, of a non-venomous snake and it's going to be a beneficial snake you know we, we talk about animals that create problems for right. us and it's rarely a snake creating a problem for us and unless it's a large rat snake and, and you're terrified of it um, then it's not going to be a problem now if it is a venomous snake as Fred said earlier um, those guys are pretty much on call 24 hours a day, you know. Mm -hmm. I think it's a blessing to see urban wildlife, my personal. It yeah. If it's wonderful, it I don't go outside to scare it off. I observe it and, and it's a blessing, provided, you know, it's, it doesn't become a nuisance. Exactly, good point. Now, Fred, we have another Facebook question. It's about animal services in general. Betty Garcia Reagan wrote, I would like my children and myself to volunteer at the animal shelter as a family. Is that possible? Sure. We have a uh, volunteer orientation. It's the first Saturday of every month. Okay. And our adoption partners, DFW Humane Society at the Irving Animal Care Compass, does our volunteer training. Mm -hmm. You can go to their website, DFW Humane Society, and there's a place you can sign up. And your children can come as long as they provide 
accompanied by an adult. Wonderful. And what are some of the things that volunteers do at the shelter? They all do uh, walking pets. It depends on your skill set and your skill level. So some like cats, some like dogs. And it can be anywhere from helping do adoption to just walking pets or playing with the cats or socializing animals. Wonderful. And speaking of socializing animals and animals in general, um, I want to broaden the conversation just a little bit in our final minutes and talk about some things that pet owners need to remember. You talked about spaying and neutering a little bit. What about microchipping? Tell me about that. Probably the single biggest thing that a, a pet owner can do is the microchip your animal. You know, we provide that service at Irving Animal Services to Irving residents for a $10 fee. It's, a, it's permanent identification that will not fall off the animal. And there's some carrots that come with that. For example, if an officer picks up an animal that's microchipped, mm -hmm. if your information is correct, he can find out in his laptop computer where you live and take that animal home and prevent a trip to the animal shelter. Or if it's stolen, and it, yeah. you know, even today we had we found two animals that were stolen two years ago by wow. calling the microchip. We took it back to a real owner. Oh, that's awesome. What about pet registration? Um, how important is that? It's very important. <laughs> if you get your animal microchip, pet registration is only $5. The intent of our pet registration program is to help us reunite your pet with you in the event something should happen, whether it's a natural disaster or a, a you know, burglary, a sure. theft. That's the intent of it. And sure. Now, how do you go about doing that? How do you get started with the pet registration? You, can, you have to have proof of rabies in the state of Texas to okay. do registration. So you could bring your proof of rabies from your veterinarian mm -hmm. to the Irving Animal Care Campus and we'll re during normal business hours and we'll be glad to register your animal. Wonderful. And the leash law is important too, right? Absolutely. Especially in the summertime, people are outside, there's more activities involved. When they're outside, they're com they take their companion animals with them. Not everybody wants that loose dog running up to you. So, you know, exercise a little bit, caution, take care of your animal. It's safer if it's on a leash. Very good. And, and back to our main topic, you guys. Uh, recap for us, Fred. What is the most important thing to remember when you encounter a wild animal? Be, be safe. Uh, call a professional. Recognize that they are a natural part of our life. They're going to be here for a long time. Urban wildlife will live among us and trying to survive. Would you like to add to that, Cliff? I certainly would. Um, I would like everybody to remember the role of the professionals in resolving these conflicts. We're here to protect the public health, safety, welfare, and property, first and foremost. Mm -hmm. Animals and their protection, a very close second. And we try to achieve that balance. Not all animals are bad. Not every coyote, just because you saw him, makes it bad. We're right. going to evaluate how much the land can support, respond to the behavior of that animal. All coyotes are not created equal. Mm -hmm. Very good. And, and Barry, any closing thoughts? Well, what I would suggest someone do is, is as I said earlier, get a field, field guide on native Texas snakes. There's a couple of them that are out there. Sure. Learn about those snakes. Be because educated you, about it. It's, oh, it's, you're going to educate yourself, power. and what that's going to do is that's going to help alleviate any fears that you may have. Well, you guys and have helped So the that. next time you see a king snake or a rat snake, you'll know it's a speckled king snake, and you're going to go, wow, cool. Well, we need to leave, leave this thing alone. Right. We don't need to call Fred or Barry or Cliff. You know? Exactly. But it's so. nice to know y'all will be there if we do need Absolutely. to call you. So yeah. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you so much for your time. It's been great talking to you and getting this information today. My pleasure. And thank you for watching. I'm Starlene Stringer. Please be sure to join us for our next edition of Open Line again at this new time, 1.30 p.m. on Thursday, September 13th. We'll be on location at the Heritage Senior Center. And if you have questions, email them to ICTN at cityofirving.org or connect with us on Facebook and we'll get answers on our next edition of Open Line. We'll see you then.